Let's look at some of the particularities that we have to consider when we design and implement interventions for digital development, be they public policies or private strategies. First of all, we are dealing with exponential technological progress and that leads to an unfathomable level of uncertainty of the future and of the trajectory that we are on. Second of all, we are dealing with a general purpose technology that is all pervasive. That means it touches all, as all different aspects from education to health to commerce to banking to the way that people find and fall in love. Third, uh, this process of creative destruction that comes with it leads to many unpredictable side effects because it's an entire ecosystem that changes with many interdependencies that make it extremely difficult to identify cause and effect. And fourth, digital networks inherently do not recognize national borders. What matters here is not geographical space, but the space of flow, the space of where information flows through the network. And that's important to consider because most policies are also business decisions often focus on the national level. But for example, if you put up a web page, it exists in the entire, in the entire world in general. It is accessible at the entire world. So digital networks are inherently international. Let's look at the uncertainty that arises from exponential technological progress. So exponential progress means some kind of doubling logic. That means that at a certain rhythm you double. Um, according to Moore's law, for example, computational capacity doubles every one, two, three years. And that has led to a lot of progress over the last four or five decades. And that also means that at each doubling step, you make as much progress as you have made since the beginning of the trajectory. So for example, here in the recent step, you made 16 steps forward uh, that led to 32 following this example. And 16 is that's as much you have made since the beginning. So that also means that if you really want to predict something that you make during the next step as much progress as you've made since the beginning. So if back here you would have been able to predict this kind of computational capacity and what's possible with it, then in theory you would be able to predict well also what would happen in the next period of what one, two, three years. That's of course very unlikely that you were able to predict that now uh, in practice actually social change does not ha happen as quickly. Technological progress might but society evolves slower because there's a diffusion process involved. Institutions have to be created. Cultural change has to happen. So this is not really one to one technology might grow at that might change at that speech. Social change is a little bit slower. Nevertheless, it in introduces a very high level of uncertainty. Uh, next, what also some people say is the singularity story. So imagine we are creating a kind of intelligence that in some aspects rivals with our intelligence. It doesn't substitute our intelligence completely, but it complements it. So there are some tasks that we certainly outsourced already to these machines that we automate, that we give to algorithms and that algorithms can do much better. Now intelligence is a very delicate issue and once you are in a development stage like this, there is certainly a lot of uncertainty that you have to deal with. Now try to make a public policy or a private strategy. Usually when you start to design it, then you convince people you're in all this policy process. It can also be, can also be business politics. You know, many companies, it's a very uh, involved process with a board and another board and some executives you have to convince and many different divisions you have to convince. Now that takes time. Now until you have an idea, you design it, until you can implement it, you know, several months, years might have passed. And by then reality might be completely different. So exponential technological progress uh, creates a high level of uncertainty that we have to deal with. Next, 
digital technology is a general purpose technology. That means you can use it for many, many different purposes. And that affects also the policy agendas. They can be very different because you can use digital technology to achieve very different goals. For example, if you look at the national digital development agendas of 17 Latin American countries that we researched here, you find that all of them agree that what is important is infrastructure and e-government. Most of them also agree that human capabilities, skills, human resources have to be trained. But then priorities are very different. Some say, well, we have to use it for e-education and e-business. Others say, no, we have to use it to develop health. Others for democracy. And some specific ones say, you know, we really want to use it rather for disaster management or for the modernization of our justice system. And you can use it for all of these different purposes. The decision on what are your priorities then also influences who leads this policy agenda, for example, in the national level, and how much resources are allocated for one or the other priority. Here, for example, you have the national ICT budget from South Korea, a total of five billions during this period, and 15% has been dedicated to broadband infrastructure. Actually, you might say only 15%. Sometimes people think, you know, all this digital revolution has to do with a lot of internet connectivity and broadband. You can see that the majority of the funds in South Korea especially have been dedicated to ICT research and development. Another 18% to the development of human resources. So there is a mix of what is getting funded. Here you have an example from Chile. And in Chile, again, often people think, well, who is responsible for a national ICT development agenda? Some people say, well, it's obviously it's the tech guys, you know, the techie guys, the, the people from the telecommunication authorities and so forth. Now in Chile, uh, during, that, during that year uh, where the study was made, the Chilean government spent $5 million, dedicated $5 million to telecommunication development nationwide. But the entire government spent over $205 million on different aspects of digitalization. For example, finance, education, defense, and health together spent 55% of the resources, more than half, over $100 million they spent here. And that also makes sense because if you develop a digital agenda, you don't want to give all the money to the telecommunication people. They know how to lay out infrastructure and how to connect a household or how to connect a, an organization. But what happens inside, you know, that differs from the different purpose. So it has to be the teachers who are in charge of digitalization inside schools, not the IT guys. It has to be the doctors and nurses who know how digitalization can best benefit a hospitals not the IT guys. And so also the policy agenda needs to be very decentralized in, in this sense. Uh, and, and, and actually it is because ICT is a general purpose technology. One exercise that we then did uh, working with the cube in practice is you can use the cube in order to identify how much money is spent on what. And you kind of like morph the cube then into different dimensions. Uh, my artist skills are not very great, so that's why I couldn't draw a cube who's morphed like that. But that's the Chilean example. So these are the Chilean expenditure priorities. You see here how much they spend in infrastructure, generic services, capacities and skills and what the different ministries are getting, the different secretaries. And then you can study actually where there are the priorities at. What does the country say? What is the ultimate purpose of digitalization? What are their priorities? The decentralized nature of policy making in ICT because of the general purpose technology nature of digital technologies it can also be seen, seen in the ICT budget in the United States. For example, the tech guys, for example, the Federal Communications Commission, the FCC, annually had a budget at that point at $8 billion. Another telecommunication authority had 
equivalently powerful budget of $7 billion, but the rest of the federal government spent over $70 billion. So that's 10 times as much. Where did they spend it? Well, at different secretaries, be it education, uh, be it health and so forth. And you can see that then at this point, the United States government put three people in charge of coordinating this decentralized agenda. They had a federal chief information officer, a chief performance officer, and a chief technology officer. So actually, if you want to do ICT policy, especially in the public sector, there's not really one number you can call and say, hey, are you in charge of digitalization? The same happens in a private sector company. You can call the IT guys, but they don't know how to best use digital technology for a specific purpose, like how to maintain customers, how to set up efficient bookkeeping, how to set up production chain control. I mean, these have been our specialized tasks that are decentralized in their responsibilities. And it is very good that it's decentralized because these are the experts who make digitalization work. Third, the digital revolution has to do with creative destruction. That means that it creates and destroys. And once creative destruction happens in such a complex ecosystem, like in social systems, it is often almost impossible to predict all the side effects because there are so many interactivities. Uh, but for example, to use a simple example from a real ecosystem, imagine a pond, a little lake, and you love barbecuing at this lake, but you're really bothered by all these insects. So what you do is you use some kind of insect uh, pesticide and you get rid of these insects. You try to reduce them. Perfect. And then you come back next month and you think, great, now you have a great pond without so many insects. But you come back and the pond is a complete mess. It is stinky. It is full of algae. There's no way you could barbecue there. What might have happened? You wanted to improve it, but, but what actually might have happened? Well, one thing that could have happened is once the insects were gone, the fish didn't have anything to eat, so the fish started to die. And, and, and once the fish died, they didn't also eat any algae, so the algae just took over and, and you created this mess that you, you never intended to create, but it's also very difficult to predict it. After the fact, in hindsight, it's always very easy to say, yeah, of course, that what happened. But in foresight, it is often very difficult to really consider all these different uh, side effects and interdependencies. For example, let's look at a previous technological revolution of a scale similar to digitalization, the transport revolution, motorization of society. So at the time the first cars were introduced in societies, there was those that argued that cars could never be on a road because obviously they would disturb the horses. So together it would never work. Now for us that sounds like a funny argument because we don't have any horses anymore on the street. But imagine for them it was completely normal to have horses and many people couldn't imagine that, you know, all the horses being gone. No, they were rather arguing from their limited perspective that, well, cars have to go because they, they would disturb all the horses. It's, it's very difficult to imagine. Then there were these others that argued that actually no, the car should be introduced. You know, because you know what it will do? It would be the perfect solution to clean up the cities. Because imagine back in these days, roads were really dirty because of all the horse dumpings. Now, the real horse that was going on was not the dumping, but this kind of claim, because obviously what we found out well, 200 years later, 150 years later, is that cities are actually quite dirty, but not because of the horse dumpings, but because of all the pollution that happened in the air. Now, it was very difficult 150 years to imagine that that might happen. It, nobody had predicted that. So nowadays, well, we introduce the driverless car and there are many predictions and people say this or that or this or that. Uh, the truth is we are dealing with such a complex ecosystem that it is very difficult to make clear predictions of what the actual effect might be. Last but not least, digital networks don't automatically recognize national borders. Cyberspace is inherently international. 
So from a policy perspective, what we have then is we have also policy agenda on the global level, on the highest level that we have. And for example, in 2003 and 2005, the world convened two world summits on the information society. That means that a head of states and also industry leaders gathered in Geneva and in Tunis um, to talk about a global policy agenda for the digital age. I was personally present in most of the negotiation, week-long negotiations that were taking place and in both of the world summits and very important uh, topics were discussed in this world summit. For example, a lot of discussions about the international divide, digital poverty, informational inequality, and also, for example, the question about global internet governance. Uh, until now, traditionally, the internet is governed by ICANN, the Internet Corporation for Assigned Names and Numbers, which is a private sector, non-profit corporation located in Southern California. Basically, what it most prominently does is it assigns names and numbers, as the name says. So, for example, if you have an internet domain name address, a URL, this is usually in words that are humanly understandable. And then what ICANN does, it assigns this name to a machine readable IP address, Internet Protocol address, which traditionally is 32 bits. More recently, it's 128 bits. And, and that's what it most prominently does. It, it governs and administrators uh, the global internet. It happens to be in Southern California because originally this job was done by an individual, by a computer scientist called John Postel, who, who studied in UCLA and then in the late 70s he joined the University of Southern California, USC, where he did this work as, as he said himself, a side job until his premature death in 1998 at the age of 55. And after he prematurely passed away, this job was then passed on or this organization was created, ICANN, as a private sector nonprofit corporation. Now, during these worldwide negotiations, some countries said, you know, the internet, that, that's a global thing that's way too important and way too big to be administered by a private sector nonprofit corporation under the California laws, under American influence, it should be, some countries said, it should be a global organization. Maybe part of the United Nations was suggested by some countries. And other countries responded, hmm, the United Nations, uh, we are not sure if the structure and the functionality of the United Nations is made for something as the internet, which often requires very quick decisions and, and cannot rely on lengthy bureaucratic processes. And others again said, well, if you make it part of a diplomatic organ, an international organization, then some countries might come in and put their influence on it. Maybe we'll try to censor it and so forth. Well, then others responded, well, while it's in the United States, who, assure, who assures us that the United States government doesn't abuse its role. So it went back and forth. Long story short, um, no consensus was reached. And ICANN still is nowadays a private sector nonprofit corporation in Southern California. But, but these kind of issues you have to talk about on a global level. So these are part of the global policy agendas and the discussion is still ongoing. While the negotiations on the global level ask big questions of global concern, there are also some questions that are better treated on a regional level. For example, while at the United Nations in Latin America, we created a regional digital development action plan, ELAC, which I will tell you more about later, and that focused on the particularities of Latin America which are different, you know, on the global level, while we were at these negotiations, Europe has very different concerns than Africa. And while you can find a common agenda of questions that they're in common, it often also makes sense to be a little bit more specific and you go and have actions plan, action plans on the regional level. Then going one level down, what is very common 
our national digital development action plan strategy agenda and every country on planet earth has some kind of ICT development agenda and, and I was personally involved in designing many of them in Latin America and here you can be even more concrete because you talk about national interests, about national legislation for example. So these digital development agendas on the national levels are, are very productive. But then you can even go deeper, for example, at the municipal level or at the local government level or also at the level of companies or organizations. Here, for example, you have a strategic development plan for the University of California at Davis that has to do with bringing lectures online in a hybrid format or in a full online format. So even an organization like the University of California Davis has a digital action plan. So also individual organizations like UC Davis have strategic action plans that aim at taking advantage of the digital revolution for their very particular purposes. So as a result you have this kind of logic. It's kind of like these Russian doll Matryoshka dolls where you have bigger ones and then a smaller one inside and a smaller one inside and a smaller one inside. And the policies on the bigger levels influence the policies on a lower level and the other the way around as well. But as digital strategies are inherently international uh, and do not recognize any geographical distance, that also, that's also what you have to work with.